I think we can start. So let me um, go ahead and introduce our speaker. We have Dr. Catherine Schumann. Uh, she's a research scientist at Orfish National Laboratory. She received her PhD in computer science from the University of Tennessee in 2015, uh, where she completed her dissert dissertation on the use of evolutionary algorithms to train a spike in neural networks for neuromorphic systems. She is uh, continuing her study of algorithms for neuromorphic computing at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. She has an adjunct faculty appointment, I think it's changing now, right? And so, <laughs> um, with the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UT, where she co-leads the TELAB Neuromorphic Computing Research Group. Uh, she has received uh, the U.S. Department of Energy Early Career Award in 2019. Uh, very excited to listen to this talk and the floor is yours. We are not seeing the... Uh, yeah, I haven't started sharing yet. I am okay. starting okay. now. I'm going to try to organize all the screens appropriately. Um, does that look okay? Can you see the full slide? Yeah. Okay, okay. great. Um, thank you so much for the introduction and, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, so I am going to be talking today about neuromorphic computing from the computer science perspective, particularly focusing on algorithms and applications. I am a computer scientist by training, so I sort of stumbled accidentally into the field of neuromorphic computing, um, but I've really enjoyed being in it for the last uh, last decade or so now. So we already covered my, my um, background. I am starting as an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee in uh, January, um, and uh, there I co-lead the, the Ten Lab Neuromorphic Computing Research Group. You can see all of the people who have participated as part of that group over the last uh, six years since we formed it in 2015. Um, and uh, if you are interested in joining our group uh, as, a, as a graduate student or a postdoc, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that. So. I mentioned that I'm coming at uh, Neuromorphic from the computer science perspective. And if I were listening to this talk as an undergrad, the first question that I would have been asking is, why, why do I care about hardware? I don't care about hardware. Why should anybody care about hardware as a computer scientist? Well, there's several reasons why it's important to look at hardware today. And the first one is the looming end of Moore's law and the end of Denard scaling. So whether you think that Moore's law has ended or will end, we are seeing the effects at least of the slowing down of Moore's law. My favorite joke about this, I have to tell this in every talk, is that the number of people who say that Moore's law, Moore's law ended doubles every two years. Whether you think it's actually ended or not, we are seeing performance implications in the applications that we're running. We're not seeing the performance speed ups that we were used to uh, with respect to how our computers were evolving over time. So if we're going to continue to see those performance improvements, we really need to be looking to new ways of doing computing. And that's led the computing community to look to new architectures and new devices and materials to potentially give us performance improvements. So at the same time that we have the looming end of Moore's Law and the end of Denard scaling, we also have a fundamentally different way that we are using computing systems, uh, particularly in the realm of artificial intelligence and machine learning. With the rise of the success of deep learning in the last decade, we're now using it in a wide variety of applications across computing. So if we're thinking about building a new type of computer because we need to see performance improvements, it would make sense that we would start to target systems that are also good at doing AI and machine learning. And the third factor that's coming into play is the rise of Internet of Things. We're pushing compute out everywhere now, everywhere from not just our, our workstations, our laptops, the cloud and high performance computers, but compute is in like our watches and our microwaves and our washing machines now. And in a lot of these locations, we need very low power implementations. We need very efficient implementations. So again, if we're thinking about building a new type of computer, it would make sense that we target something that can run more efficiently um, in, in performing the applications of interest. So with these three factors in mind, it makes sense that the community would be looking for inspiration and in how to build a new type of computer to the brain and, and particularly in neural network inspired hardware um, because the brain is the ultimate learning machine and it does so with very, very low power. So I'm going to briefly talk about neural hardware first primarily as a contrast point to neuromorphic computing and then I'll spend the rest of the talk focused on neuromorphic computing. So neural hardware systems are those that accelerate traditional neural network and deep learning computation. They are built to do today's algorithm and they do today's algorithms very, very well. An example of a neural hardware system is Google's tensor processing unit, the TPU. 
with these systems, you tend to have very low power or very fast computations. They tend to be targeted towards training operations or inference operations. So for example, the TPU has a cloud version and it has an edge version. These systems are currently deployed in cloud and mobile devices. You can go out and buy them on your favorite online retailer. I have a couple of them sitting on my desk right now. Um, you can go find those wherever you need them to be. Now, the key thing about neural hardware systems is that they accelerate traditional neural network computation. And I wasn't sure what the background was of everybody who was going to be attending the talk, so I'll just very quickly go through um, what I mean by traditional artificial neural network computation. So this is very much a cartoon level view of a feed forward multilayer perceptron. But just to remind you, the way that these networks perform computation is they receive input values, numerical input values on the input neurons, and the way that computation is done as it passes through the network is we take all of the synapses uh, weight values in the, the layer connecting the inputs to the first hidden layer. We form a weight matrix and we do a matrix vector multiplication followed by a nonlinear activation function to get the output at the next layer. And we repeat this sort of computation throughout. So neural hardware systems are built to do this sort of matrix vector computation with the nonlinear activations and they do that computation very, very, very well. So that's ne neural hardware. And when I'm talking about neuromorphic computing, I'm not talking about these systems. Uh, in particular, when I'm talking about neuromorphic computing, the way that I define it is they implement spiking recurrent neural network computation. They take more inspiration from the brain and how they're Im implemented, so much so that they can actually be suitable for neuroscience simulation. Now, from the computer science perspective, the thing that's most exciting about neuromorphic computers is that there's significant promise for future algorithmic development in developing new ways of doing machine learning and AI with these systems. You can also get fast computation and very low power with these systems, but they're still under active development. Though companies like IBM and Intel have invested in neuromorphic chips like True North and Loihi, they're not things that have been brought to market yet, so you can't go buy a neuromorphic system uh, on you know, Amazon just yet. Um, but hopefully soon in the future. However, it is under active development in the research community. So now's the time to get involved in the development of not just the, the algorithms and applications, but also even the hardware itself. So what does a neuromorphic computer actually look like? Well, in the fundamental hardware, in the architecture itself of the computer, it's made up of neurons and synapses. Here I'm showing a grid layout. Um, not every neuromorphic computer is organized as a grid. In fact, most of them are not. This is just showing that the, the neurons are connected to each other with uh, synapses and that there are lots of them. Uh, they operate in a massively parallel way. Both neurons and synapses have a notion of computation and memory, and they're all co-located. Um, and then what I have on the, the right side of the slide here is an animation. We'll come back to this animation later. Um, but this is showing one of the properties of the way that neuromorphic computers operate. They are event driven. What you're seeing are neurons and synapses in this animation. When the neurons are lighting up, that's when they're active, otherwise they're idle. When the synapses are lighting up, they're active, otherwise they're idle. In neuromorphic systems, the neurons and synapses are only doing work when there's work to be done. Thus, they have extremely low power operation. So this is part what gives them their extreme efficiency in, in actually implementing the hardware. So from an algorithmic computer science level, what makes neuromorphic computing different from neural hardware is the type of neural network that it implements. So neuromorphic computing systems implement spiking recurrent neural networks. So this is the same sort of cartoon level view of a spiking neural network as the, the feed forward uh, network you saw before was. Um, the key difference between spiking neural networks and traditional artificial neural networks is that they include time components on the neurons and synapses. Time is fundamental in the way that spiking neural networks process information. There's also tend to be more complex network structures in our spiking neural networks. You can see recurrent connectivity here. You can even see things like multi edges to neurons connected by um, two edges on the on two synapses um, that are functionally different because they might have two different time delays. In general, spiking neural networks can have any two neurons connected to each other via synapse or more than one synapse. Spiking neural networks also receive input over time in the form of spikes, and it produces output over time in the form of spikes. So here is a little animation that will show you how spiking neural networks process information. You can see incoming spikes to the, the input neurons 
Once the, the first two spikes reach two of the input neurons, that's going to cause those neurons to fire, generating internal spikes that are now traveling throughout the network. So even though those, those first three spikes that were generated were generated at the same time, they're arriving at the hidden neurons in the network at different points in time. This is because the synapses have different delays on them. And you can see the spikes traveling throughout the network. The timing of the arrival of spikes has an important impact on the way that these networks are performing computation. The timing of the arrival of input spikes encodes information, and the timing of the output spikes that are coming out of the network also impacts how the network is performing. So hopefully that little animation gave you a little bit better of an idea of what's going on in spiking neural networks. I've certainly spent a really long time making it in PowerPoint, um, but it's a toy one. It's not actually doing anything. This network, you already saw this video smaller on the previous slide. This is actually a spiking neural network that is solving a real task. And so in this, in this animation, there are the input neurons shown in yellow over here, the output neurons are shown in red, and then the hidden neurons are, are the teal neurons shown throughout. Um, the sy synapses that are connecting them are both excitatory and inhibitory. Those are the two different colors. And what you're going to see in this video again is there's input information coming into the inputs being stimulated from the outside. And it's causing those input neurons to fire, generating spikes that are now propagating throughout the network. And you can see the spikes are traveling back and forth throughout the network. The timing of the arrival of the spikes is happening at different times because of the different synaptic delays. And you see this flurry of activity um, that's being, being developed in the network. This particular network is performing a scientific data classification task. We'll talk more about it uh, later in the presentation. Um, but what we're doing is we're monitoring the, the output neurons to see how many times each of them are, are firing, and it's giving us a classification. Okay, so that's the, the sort of neural network model that's running on these systems. But a big area of research in the field of neuromorphic computing is how we're actually going to build the underlying hardware and what the hardware is actually going to look like. So I wanted to just quickly briefly detour into neuromorphic hardware research because it is a huge part of the field. Um, neuromorphic device research and materials research covers a wide swath of different types of ways you can build these computers. I'm highlighting three examples here, but keep, keep in mind that these are by no means comprehensive. There are many, many, many other neuromorphic implementations and many different ways you can build these systems. Uh, but these are three specific ones that I have worked with um, with my collaborators. So the first is neuromorphic systems built with metal oxide memristors to be the synapses in, in the neuromorphic system. Uh, this is a, a system called Mr. Dana that's developed at, at University of Tennessee by Garrett Rose's uh, research group. And we've, we've worked with this system and it certainly has different behaviors than what you would see with a conventional CMOS digital system. Another example of some neuromorphic hardware uh, implementations is a superconducting optoelectronic neuromorphic hardware. Uh, where the neurons are actually superconducting off to electronic neurons and the synapses are magnetic Joseph's injunctions. This is a system that's developed by Sonia Buckley's group at NIST, and it, as you can imagine, has radically different properties than the memristive implementation. And then perhaps the absolute weirdest neuromorphic hardware implementation that I've worked with uh, was developed by researchers at Oak Ridge, led by Pat Collier, and this is a biomimetic neuromorphic implementation where the synaptic device is literally two water droplets that are encased in lipids and squished together to form a membrane, and the membrane acts as the synaptic device. It is a, an extremely weird device with very different behaviors from what you would see in the memristive implementation or the superconducting optoelectronic implementation. And so we have to target it and behave very differently when we're, when we're programming these systems. So this is just to give you an idea of the diversity of hardware that exists in the field. Now, it's really exciting to have all of the different hardware implementations. It also makes it really difficult to work with it from a computer science perspective. We're basically reinventing every aspect of the compute stack simultaneously. There's research ongoing in everywhere from the materials that you're using to the devices, to the architecture, all the way up to the applications and the algorithms. And unlike traditional computing, back to that question of why you should care about hardware, even though I'm a computer scientist who does all of my research in the application algorithms and system software space, everything that's going on at the low levels of the compute stack influences what I'm doing. So when I'm thinking about building an algorithm or an application for a neuromorphic hardware implementation, I can never forget that I'm targeting a particular neuromorphic hardware implementation in the background. <laughs> 
So this is always coming into play when I'm talking about algorithms and applications. So let's talk about some of the algorithms for neuromorphic systems. Uh, a couple of years ago, some colleagues and I did a survey paper, it's available in archive, of neuromorphic computing and neural networks and hardware. And we were asking a variety of questions uh, in the field. And one of those was, what are the algorithms that people are using? And you can see a, a breakdown of the different types of algorithms that are being used in the field on the right of the slide. But as I mentioned, we cannot disjoint algorithms from hardware. There are key considerations for algorithm development on neuromorphic hardware. One of those is realizable network structures. Not every network configuration can be realized on every neuromorphic hardware implementation, and that might limit which algorithms you can actually use. Many neuromorphic hardware implementations actually have reduced precision in the synaptic weights values that they can realize, so we often have to make some sort of algorithmic adaptation to accommodate for that. Some neuromorphic implementations will have on-chip training uh, mechanisms. Some will support chip in the loop training. Um, a lot of them just have off chip training performance, and this will have an impact again on the algorithms that we're selecting. We often have to deal with noise, process variation, and cycle to cycle variation on these systems. We have to consider whether the hardware is optimized for training or inference, and we have to think about what the reconfigurability of the neuromorphic hardware actually is. What can we mess with when we're, when we're working with these different algorithms? So I'm going to go over very briefly two different types of, of neuromorphic algorithms, the two most popular, before I delve into to my area of research in, in algorithms, which is primarily in the evolutionary space. So the most popular supervised learning approach in, in neuromorphic computing are, is backpropagation-like approaches. So backpropagation-like approaches in the hardware require dense connectivity. They require you to be able to realize the, these feed-forward structures. They tend to, to um, be implemented on, on for example, crossbar-like neuromorphic architectures. But we have to make algorithmic adaptations when we're working with backpropagation for spiking recurrent neuromorphic hardware. And the biggest adaptation is that we have to do something to accommodate for the non-differentiability of spiking neurons. Spiking neurons basically accumulate charge until a threshold is reached and then they fire. That activation function is not differentiable and backpropagation relies on the differentiability of the activation function. So if you're using a backpropagation-like approach for a spiking neural network, you have to make some sort of accommodation to approximate differentiability. Um, but one of the most popular ways of training these is to make some sort of accommodation for that. Often we have to, to do something to deal with low precision weights on our neuromorphic hardware. Fortunately, there's a lot of research in that space and across the field of deep learning um, where we're looking at sort of quantizing the weights to have more efficient hardware. So there's a lot of approaches to help with that. Perhaps the most frustrating part about, about backpropagation like approaches for me for spiking neural networks is that they take a non-standard approach to delays. So they'll often ignore the delay component of spiking neural networks altogether. So the key advantage of using these approaches is that there's literally decades of knowledge about traditional artificial neural networks, and they are clearly extremely successful in, in real world applications today. And so we would like to be able to implement them and use these algorithms on neuromorphic hardware. And we have successfully. But a key disadvantage, as maybe I telegraphed by my frustration, is that they don't work natively on many of the features of spiking neural networks. They're not necessarily leveraging the inherent characteristics of spiking neural networks. Um, and I think we're leaving a lot on the table when we're limiting ourselves to just these algorithmic approaches. So by far the most popular training approach for neuromorphic systems is synaptic plasticity mechanisms. The one that I'm highlighting on the slide here is an approach called spike timing dependent plasticity. Uh, wherein the weight values are updated in the network based on the timing of the arrival of spikes throughout the network. So this is sort of on the opposite side from backpropagation. It is taking intense inspiration from the neuroscience in the way that these are implemented, and it is inherently relying on the computational characteristics of the network um, to, to implement these sorts of algorithms. So this is a, a form of heavy in learning. You can think of it as neurons that fire together, wire together, but the timing of the fires also influences how the weight changes are done. So the key advantage for these approaches is that they are biologically inspired. They leverage a lot of the characteristics of these systems, and they've even sh been shown to be useful in some unsupervised learning tasks. However, their success on particularly unsupervised learning tasks has been relatively limited and on some simple tasks, and it tends to have to be pretty hand-tuned to make it work. Um, so I would say the key disadvantage for these is that they're still not very well understood, and we're still using spike timing-dependent plasticity, even though that's been known as one of these key mechanisms in neuroscience for decades, 
I think we still need to look to neuroscience for more inspiration to, to draw more ideas of how we can do learning in neuromorphic systems and leverage their underlying characteristics. So those are two of the algorithmic approaches. Now I'm going to talk about evolutionary optimization for neuromorphic systems. Um, this is an approach that, that uh, we developed. I started developing it as my uh, graduate work at, at UT and have continued at um, Oak Ridge. Uh, we call it EONS. Um, we're not the only people doing evolutionary optimization for neuromorphics, but this is particularly EONS in this case. And so the idea for EONS is that we want to start with a particular neuromorphic hardware implementation that we want to target. And we want to start with a particular application that we want to apply that hardware implementation to. And we assume that we know nothing about how to solve that problem, um, which is actually often the case uh, for these systems. And so what we start with is a collection of randomly initialized potential solutions for this task to form our initial population. Here I'm showing four different networks. Typically our populations have 100 to 1,000 individuals. You can see that they have different numbers of neurons, different numbers of synapses, and their parameters are also different from network to network. And what we're going to do is evaluate and rank these individuals from best to worst. And the way that that evaluation is done is we take each of the networks, we load them onto the neuromorphic hardware or a simulation of the hardware more usually, and then we run it on the task or a simulation of the task, and we get a score for how well it's performing. How we score it depends on what the task is. If it's classification, we tend to use something like accuracy. If it's control, it tends to be a more reward-oriented score. But we get a score for how well each of them are performing. And that allows us to rank them from best to worst. Now, at the beginning, when they're randomly initialized, they're all pretty terrible. But some are less terrible than others, so we can establish this ranking. We then do selection to preferentially select better performing networks to serve as parents while still maintaining some diversity in the population. And then we perform reproduction operations to produce children. Our reproduction operations include just straight cloning a parent into a child, random mutations like adding or deleting a neuron or synapse, and crossover where two parents generate two children that inherit characteristics from both parents. This completes a generation of eons and then we repeat this process with the child population. And we do this over and over again over the course of generations and the networks get better and better at solving the problem. Now, the key disadvantage for evolutionary optimization approaches for training neuromor neuromorphic and neural networks more broadly is that they can be slow to train. There's a reason the system is called eons. It's not as bad as you might think, though. Um, it's actually all of the applications that I'm going to show you later in the talk. Uh, it took between an hour and 24 hours to train. So why do we use evolutionary optimization? There are actually a lot of reasons we do. Um, it's applicable to a wide variety of tasks. I sort of hinted at that with the, the way that we evaluate performance on these applications. You can use eons on a classification task. You can move it to a control task. You can move it to a prediction task. You can move it to an anomaly detection task. All you're changing in the algorithm is the way that you're evaluating that fitness function. It's applicable to different architectures and devices, and it operates within the characteristics and constraints of the architecture or device. So it will tailor the design of the network to the particular hardware to try to leverage however that hardware works or work within its quirks, let's say. And let me say that neuromorphic implementations have quirks. So for example, those three different hardware implementations that I talked about earlier, eons would tailor a network design to each of those individually. Um, you're not relying on training one network and then mapping it onto the individual hardware. It can learn the topology and the parameters of the network. It can interact with software simulations or directly with the hardware, so it can do chip in the loop optimization. And if you happen to have a supercomputer, you can scale up to run on as many cores, as many nodes that you have available to you. It is parallelizable or scalable, so you can get to better solutions faster by using more compute resources. Um, we don't always run eons on a supercomputer. I'm mostly running eons on my laptop, but in case you happen to have one, like we do at Oak Ridge, you can absolutely use it to get to better solutions faster. Okay, so those are some algorithms. The applications that I'm going to be talking to you about, we're going to be using evolutionary optimization in all of them. Our research group also does research on backpropagation like approaches and synaptic plasticity, as well as other algorithms. Um, also, we're a one size fits all, we, we do everything um, in terms of algorithms, but we focus a lot on evolution. Now we're going to talk about applications of neuromorphic.
Um, so a couple of years ago, we had a workshop at Oak Ridge National Lab where a bunch of researchers in neuromorphic computing came um, and we were going to work on a report. So I basically locked a bunch of the neuromorphic computing researchers in a room and said, hey, tell me what the characteristics are of an application that would make neuromorphic good for it. This is the list that they came up with. Spatiotemporal, no noisy input, real-time processing, multimodal, low power, not high precision, requiring robustness and continuous learning. So I use this chart as if your application has one or more of these characteristics, neuromorphic computing might be right for you. So what are some of the areas uh, where these might make sense? Um, at, at Oak Ridge National Lab and at the Department of Energy more broadly, we're very interested in using neuromorphic computing for scientific discovery to analyze scientific data. We're also thinking about neuromorphic uh, computers as future coprocessors in, in uh, supercomputers and high-performance computing systems. We're thinking about them for large-scale data analytics, perhaps in a data center, for cybersecurity applications, for autonomous vehicles, for robotics, for Internet of Things, and for smart sensors. So this is running the gamut from the biggest computers in the world to the smallest computers in the world. A wide variety of different application types have different characteristics that could benefit from neuromorphic computing. So now I'm going to highlight a couple of my favorite uh, application examples from the last few years. Uh, and the first one falls in the realm of scientific discovery. Uh, this was some work that was in collaboration with researchers at Fermi National Accelerator Lab, which is a DOE lab um, in just outside Chicago. And we were working with data from the Minerva experiment. This is a neutrino scattering experiment. You can see the Minerva detector on the slide. Um, it's school bus size detector. There's a little person there for scale. I got to visit it. There's me in a hard hat um, visiting the detector. You can see the detector behind me. Um, so what happens with this detector is that it is exposed to a neutrino beam at the front here going through the green plate. And what they're looking at is they're trying to study neutrino nucleus scattering events that are happening within the detector. The problem is that the detector itself doesn't, doesn't actually detect that event. It detects just energy levels throughout. So they had a machine learning task, in particular a classification task, which is to look at the data that's coming off the detector and to classify the horizontal region where the neutrino nucleus scattering interaction originated. Uh, the data, when you actually look at it in images, looks like fireworks, like bursts of fireworks. And so we wanted to figure out where the original interaction that caused the bursting to occur happened within this data. So at Oak Ridge, we actually took both a deep learning convolutional neural network approach as well as a neuromorphic spiking neural network approach. And we got comparable accuracies on both. The difference in accuracies here is negligible. But what's really interesting here is the size of the networks that we produced. So you can see the spiking neural network here on the slide. Actually, the network you saw in the animation earlier was one of these networks for the, this uh, Minerva data task. This network has 90 neurons and 86 synapses. It's not even fully connected. It's not using all of the input neurons to make a decision. So why is that interesting? If you're familiar with the structure of a convolutional neural network, you can see these last couple of layers here are fully connected with dropout layers in between them. This fully connected layer has 98 neurons in it. Just this layer is bigger than the entire spiking neural network. So in the case of a scientific instrument task like this, energy usage may not be your, your biggest you know, question. We estimated that we could do this with a memorist of neuromorphic implementation with about 1.66 microjoules per classification, but maybe you don't care about power when you have a school bus size detector. So why does it matter in this case? The smaller the network, the faster you can actually run it. And if the data is coming really fast in one of these big science experiments, that's an advantage. You wanna be able to process the data in real time. So that's one of the examples of an application. The other three examples I'm gonna give you are actually control tasks that we've looked at. So this first one was actually a senior design project at the University of Tennessee uh, back in 2017. And uh, both of these students, one is now uh, a, a researcher at Microsoft and, and the other is uh, getting his PhD at Georgia Tech. But they were in our 10 lab neuromorphic computing research group and they decided that they wanted to build a robot that would be entirely controlled by an onboard neuromorphic system. And the task for this robot was to navigate and explore an unfamiliar environment while avoiding obstacles. They wanted to be able to drop this robot into any environment, have it cover as much ground as possible, and avoid obstacles along the way. So you can think of it as like a surveillance or a search, search and rescue task, or you can think of it like a smart Roomba. Vacuum everywhere, don't run into the cat. So the challenges that they were imposing on this, in addition to having it be entirely controlled by an onboard neuromorphic implementation, 
is we wanted to process all of the inputs on board and make all control decisions on board. The inputs are just the LiDAR sensor that's on the front of the robot. It's actually on a servo that's sweeping back and forth to give input from the environment. And the outputs from the neuromorphic implementation are the motor controls of the robot. Left motor forward, left motor back, right motor forward, and right motor back. So when we say we gave it no explicit instructions on how to operate, it literally doesn't even know how to turn left and right. When we first start, it has to learn how to do that over the course of training. It also has no prior knowledge about the environment. We train in some fixed environmental configurations, but we expect it to be able to translate to environments it's never seen before. And finally, we trained only in simulation, and we expect it to be able to translate into the real world. So what did the simulated environment look like? It looked like this. It was very simple. The robot is a sphere. It's the red sphere. Uh, the obstacles are also spheres in the environment. This is after the network has been trained, and you can see it's covering ground in the simulated environment, avoiding obstacles along the way. Um, and it has to have some sort of memory about where it's been to be able to cover new ground in the environment. Um, so we're trying to leverage some of the temporal processing capabilities here. So we trained a network with eons. Um, this actually trained in under 24 hours, and then we deployed it to the physical robot. This first clip is the very first time that we ran it. That's why all the students are in the background. Uh, yes, they did pull whatever was in the professor's offices out to act as obstacles. Why one of them had a Law and Order video game, I don't know. But that happened to be one of the obstacles in his in his environment. So you can see. Uh, that the robot, its name is Neon, uh, was able to translate what it learned in simulation into the real world. It also actually works with dynamic obstacles, um, even though we didn't train it with uh, moving obstacles in the training environment. And um, we did test it with moving obstacles, although we don't have video for it. Usually we were the moving obstacles. <laughs> we were following it around the room. Um, but it was able to translate into the real world. And um, it was having good coverage skills in the environment. I think later in this video, I'm going to skip to the end. Um, one of the ways we saw that it had good coverage skills is that the students had actually blocked off a part of the room with traffic cones, and they thought that they had kept the traffic cones too close together that the robot couldn't make it through, and then it did, and they panicked because it was not supposed to be in that space, and the, the video ends abruptly. So if you happen to have like a toddler at home, you, you, you know this feel of like, oh, it's doing something, it's not supposed to, the video ends abruptly, and you chase after it. Um, but it was covering as much ground as possible within the environment. So that's one, uh, one application. Um, another one, this is actually something that we've done in the last year. Um, this is working with researchers at Oak Ridge National Lab's National Transportation Research Center. And in this case, we wanted to use a neuromorphic implementation to control how much fuel is being injected in an internal combustion engine to reduce the amount of fuel needed to run that engine, but still keep the engine running normally. So what happens in an internal combustion engine is as you're decreasing the fuel that you're injecting at each cycle, you're making it more likely to partial burn or misfire, which will cause the engine to have undesired levels of noise, vibration, and harshness. And so what we wanted to do was train a spiking neural network that we could deploy to a neuromorphic system that would in real time monitor state from the engine and make a decision about how much fuel to inject at the next cycle to keep the engine running as normally as possible while still, um, while still decreasing the amount of fuel required. So we actually did some training on Summit with our EONS training approach. Uh, we did not use the full supercomputer. We used all of 24 nodes of the 27,000 uh, for two hours to train a couple of spiking neural networks that we could then deploy to the neuromorphic system and test it in the real world. So we did all of our training and simulation with the engine with a simulated engine on the supercomputer. And again, we expected it to be able to translate what it learned in simulation to operate with the physical engine in the real world. Um, the system that we deployed this to uh, is a neuromorphic implementation. It's an FPGA-based neuromorphic implementation that's developed at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's a system called Microcaspian. I have it shown on the slide here. Hopefully, you can still see my camera. This is the board itself. Um, so it's small, uh, chapstick for scale. Um, yeah, the FPGA that's actually running this is, is this little system here. Uh, the FPGA is less than $10 and um, runs at about 10 to 20 milliwatts. So this is cheap, low power. If you custom fab the chip, you could get an order of magnitude lower power, but even with the FPGA, you're getting pretty good performance. So this all took place over the course of the pandemic. Um, so I trained at my house in this chair. Uh, running all of the simulated uh, engines, running eons, 
uh, SSHing into the supercomputer. Um, once we had networks that we were ready to test on, I emailed them to Parker Mitchell, who developed MicroCaspian. He got it working on the hardware at his house. He drove the hardware to the National Transportation Research Center, handed it to the transportation researcher in the parking lot. He took it inside, plugged it into the engine, and this is the video that he took. So this is the one of the MicroCaspian uh, implementations. You can tell this is real science because it's all duct taped together. This is plugged into a host computer. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear the roar of the engine, so brace yourselves. If you are, I'm going to hit play on this. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. The engine is roaring in my ears. Um, it's plugged into a host computer. It's reading uh, sensor information, three values from the engine in real time here, and it's outputting a fuel amount to inject it each cycle back into the engine. This is real time state information for how the engine is performing. And there is the engine itself within the lab. So we were able to show that the networks we trained in simulation, some of them did actually outperform the previous control strategies in the physical environment. This work is ongoing. Um, this is actually the work I'm going to be presenting on Monday. We're looking at doing real time evolution to continue to adapt with the engine in the loop um, to the, the particular environmental operating conditions of the engine um, and hope that we can actually deploy this in, in future vehicles uh, with internal combustion engines. So this was a really fun pandemic project. I still very much like to see this actually happening in the in the lab. I haven't made it in to actually see it yet, but that's why we have this video. Um, so this other, this last one that I'm going to highlight is also a pandemic project. Um, so we wanted to have another platform that we could evaluate neuromorphic computing on, um, because actually evaluating in the real world gives us an idea of how these systems can actually perform. Um, so in this case, we were looking at a one tenth scale racing of Formula One. Um, you can see the car here in the picture. Uh, this is actually a broader community, the F110 community. They have instructions for how to build this car and they have lots of software associated with it. If you're interested in, in building one of your own, I, I uh, invite you to check it out. But we are actually using it because it's a relatively inexpensive real world demonstration of what neuromorphic computing can provide. And it's our first step along the long path towards neuromorphic control for autonomous vehicles. So again, we want to train entirely in simulation. In this case, we're using the F110 simulator that is provided to the community. Again, the car has LiDAR sensors, just like the neon robot did. It has a LiDAR sensor that sits on top of the car and spins. Uh, the output here for the network is the steering angle and the speed um, for the car. And we train in simulation, and then we want to deploy to the physical implementation on board the car. And so this is what the training environment looks like. Um, hopefully you can see this little black dot here. That's the car. Um, we actually train in one tenth scale Formula One tracks. That's what the, the simulator that they provide does. This is Catalonia. If you happen to be a Formula One fan, I am not. So it could be anything. Um, but you can see the car in simulation was trained. This is one of the training tracks that we use. We used five Formula One tracks for training. We then tested the implementation on another set of Formula One tracks. I don't know which ones these are. Here's one. Uh, we considered it fully trained if it completed two laps on each of our five training tracks. Um, on the three of the, the, net, the uh, tracks that I'm showing here, it completes two laps as well. I'll skip ahead. Here's another track where it's completing two laps and another one where it's completing two laps. It's not perfect. Um, so when I say it's usually able to extend what it has learned, uh, even in the simulated environment, there's still some cases it's going to crash down here in this hairpin turn in some cases where it hasn't quite learned how to navigate every possible scenario but we felt pretty confident that it was ready to be able to be deployed onto the physical car however if you want to test a little autonomous race car you need a racetrack and so we built a racetrack uh, we built a racetrack in my basement uh, which is where I work every day. So in the rest of the space here, this was actually at my house in my basement because that's how science is done these days. Um, and you can see the car is navigating uh, and the racetrack along the way. This it would actually continue driving around this racetrack. We we videoed it for two laps. One of the things that we're seeing in the physical car, as we saw in simulation, is we're getting some of this weaving behavior. That's actually something we're trying to optimize out of the the uh, the way the network is performing. We started with just trying to make sure it could navigate along the track safely. Um, we have reached that point. We are now optimizing for speed. Um, we're trying to turn it into a real race car, so we want to make it go fast. 
around the track. Ideally not in my basement anymore. We took down the track. We're, we're trying to get to a bigger space um, so that we can do testing there as well. Um, so why is neuromorphic interesting for these last three examples, robotics, the engine control, and the autonomous vehicle? Well, in all of these cases, you're talking about deploying something to an environment in the real world, and you want it to be able to run on as low power as possible. In the case of the engine, you want it to be able to do that because um, you don't want the compute cost to reduce the fuel amount to use more energy than what you're saving by reducing the fuel amount. Um, in the robotics and autonomous vehicle case, you want to have as much of your power devoted towards the engine control and actually running the car and not in the compute because you don't want to drain the batteries sooner than you would like. Uh, in addition, you need real-time responses in all of these cases. We're, we're talking about responding in on the order of milliseconds, which is not super fast, but you still need to be able to have that real-time um, response rate. So that's why neuromorphic is important for these. And in all of these, they have a temporal element where we're also trying to leverage the, the temporal processing capabilities of the spiking neural networks. Okay, so I'm getting close to my time. I may not take my brief detour. Um, I was going to do a, a very brief detour. Do I have time? I mean, we're having fun, so you can go ahead. Okay, I, very brief detour. Um, so all of that was machine learning. All of that was neural networks on neuromorphic hardware. Well, I'm not going to go over these properties again because we've talked about them throughout. But neuromorphic systems are just a particular way to do computing. There's nothing that says they have to be doing neural network computation. They're useful for more than just machine learning algorithms. So we've used neuromorphic systems to do lots of different graph algorithms. One is shortest path calculations, um, where we convert graphs onto spiking neural networks, and we can compute single source shortest path lengths. Um, in around April 2020, we also were asking ourselves, you know, for no particular reason, if you could use neuromorphic systems to model epidemic spread, turns out you can. Um, you can use your neurons as individuals in the population, your synapses as shared social connections, and your spikes as transmission of infection. By setting different parameters in the network, you allow for different conditions, and you can replicate SIR, susceptible infected recovered curves, that you see with other types of uh, epidemic modeling uh, systems with a neuromorphic uh, hardware implementation. So it's not just neural networks. You can They're just computers that can do computing in a different way than traditional computers. OK, so to quickly summarize, neuromorphic computers are a new type of computer inspired by biological brains. You program them with spiking neural networks. There are a variety of ways that spiking neural networks can be trained. There's not one clear winner. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. We've applied neuromorphic to a wide variety of applications, including scientific data analysis and robotics. And my favorite thing is to see a neuromorphic system controlling something in the real world. And neuromorphic computers are useful for more than just neural network computation. There's a whole wide realm of different types of computation that neuromorphic computers can potentially be useful for. And that's really a wide open question in the research field. So with that, I'll thank my collaborators at Oak Ridge and at the Tin Lab Neuromorphic Computing Research Group at University of Tennessee, as well as our funding agencies. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. If you have any interest in collaborating, you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I'm not sure we had any talks before that we were exposed to this much technical test and we had that much fun. So <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, I think we do have some questions. Uh, yeah. so let me, um, take a look at some of them starting from the beginning. So, um, so Matthew Sharp uh, is asking, are we advanced to the point where these SNNs can be linked and differentiated to take on a specific task working together like a functional brain? Like multitasking, I believe that's what, what is you know, being adverse, you know? I don't know. That's my guess. I don't think we're, I, there is work to try to get neuromorphic systems to model neural systems, but I don't know that we're to the point where we're like multitasking, moving towards general AI. I think we're still in the early stages for actually training. From the neuroscience perspective, the work that's done on neuromorphic tends to be more on like studying neuroscience, modeling neuroscience. Um, but I think there is a lot of opportunity to, to, use neuromorphic systems to study neuroscience to inform how we should build future neuromorphic systems to make them better. I don't know if that makes sense or if that answers your question, but 
Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so there is a follow up question also on the application side. Do you are you aware of any natural language processing application or morphic company being used for those kind of applications? Yes. I point to them in the survey paper. I don't personally work on any natural language processing, um, but there is work that's being done in the field. Um, so I, I, one, I would point you to the survey paper. You can find them from there, um, but I can also point you to them if you if you email me. I can point you to some of the work in that space. Okay. Um, so we have a question about, I mean, we actually have a couple of questions about the evolutionary algorithms. One of them is about uh, optimization, the convergence time. How long? Mm -hmm. I think you kind of touched on that, but maybe you want to explain a little bit more. And also, we can, maybe we can answer both at the same time. It goes back to like 2021, which I believe when you were talking about the evolutionary structures, you know, how the mm -hmm. topology is changing. And so it's basically asking that, uh, how does that affect the, time and accuracy like you know what is pretty much what is the metric that you've been using because you said we can use different metrics what is the metric that you are targeting so we in terms of time i think for all of the applications i told you those were trained in under under 24 hours the um the fermilab data was 24 hours because uh particularly because the data set was large um, so it just took longer to churn through the data the more data you have the longer it takes to run each fitness evaluation um, I don't remember exactly how many generations that occurred over the course of those 24 hours. I'd have to track that down. Uh, for the F110 example and the engine example and the robot, all of those were trained in two hours on a workstation. Um, we can actually, for the F110 example, we can get to pretty good solutions in about 10 minutes. Um, we typically, when we're adding additional objectives, uh, we train for longer just to give it more time to optimize. So in the, in the case of objectives, for classification, we often start with accuracy. Uh, for control, it depends on the application. Um, so in the case of the uh, F110, uh, the fitness objective was, can you complete two laps? You're, you're considered fully trained um, if you're able to complete two laps on the five, um, five training tracks. But that, that particular like sort of accuracy or reward metric is different from task to task. But in addition to, to just like performance on the task, we've also done multi-objective optimization with our evolutionary approaches where we're trying to minimize the network size to get the smallest possible network. Um, we've also done uh, optimization for resiliency so that we can be resilient to hardware failures. So you have the option to add in these additional objectives that you're training towards. As you're doing that, you're likely increasing your training time, but you may be okay with that if you're trying to get the smallest possible network that you're then gonna deploy because it would be more efficient and faster in the deployment stage. So I actually have a question too. Uh, so when we are using the evolutionary algorithm for optimization, are we just opt optimizing the network in our structure or actually we're using that for learning too? So what is the training mechanism basically? We're using it for, for both in all of the cases as you saw here, we're training the structure of the network as well as the parameters. However, we have used evolution with other training mechanisms as the actual way you're defining the parameters. Um, we've used it with plasticity mechanisms. We've used it with backpropagation based training approaches. We've, we've even used it in like liquid state machine uh, optimization as well. Um, so it's really nice with evolution is that you can stack it and remove what you're optimizing depending on what you need. Okay. Thank you. So we have a question here too. Uh, yes, my question is since stocking neural networks are time dependent, how can you distinguish between when you have several inputs in a row? How can you distinguish between uh, echo or response from previous input and the, re the response to the new one? How do you distinguish them? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So for, well, one, I will say that even how you encode information into the network, like how you take you know, the sensor data coming from the engine, the data coming off, like how you turn that into spikes to go in is also a big research question. It's, we've done some work in encoding approaches. In the control strategies, the primary way that we do it, because we're like constantly providing output, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not losing the memory in the network between each decision. We're applying the inputs sequentially over time. We're simulating for some amount of time for each time step. And then we only look at the fires that happened within that that last simulation time period um, to inform what the current action is going to be. But the activity in the network is still left over from previous 
So it's meant to be potentially accumulating information over time. But we actually just look at the fires on the outputs for whatever happened in the last like, you know, 100 time steps or whatever. Thank you. And the second question is about balance and acceptance and inhibitor endurance in your system. Do you have some uh, algorithm for, uh, like for, uh, in the, for initial guess of how they should be placed and how many they should be placed in uh, related to each other, or you just put randomly some number of yeah, yeah. We just do randomly because we often have no idea. Like. We'll do trial and error, and we actually do hyperparameter optimization on the outside um, to to tune the parameters of the algorithms and things like encoding and decoding approaches. Um, but yeah, we we tend to err on the side of starting as simple and small as possible and letting it build up in complexity. Um, but beyond that, unless we have some sort of intuition about the problem, um, we'll we'll maybe scale the size of the network depending on you know the number of inputs and outputs. But beyond that, we don't have a good guess more generally. Thank you. And may I have one question, please? Uh, yes, I said maybe about your evolutionary approach. Maybe you tried uh, starting from fully connected network and then just having uh, pruning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we haven't done that simply because we typically evaluating the, the fitness requires you simulating the network and if you have a densely connected network to start with it's more expensive to evaluate on it um, so that's why we usually start small and build up but well, you could totally start fully connected and prune out um, yeah it, you could easily do that we could adapt the algorithm easily to do that so I guess one last question uh, is the FPGA workflow open source is there something that other we very much want to open source it. That's something, so it was developed at Oak Ridge, and so IP is weird. Um, if you're interested in collaborating with that, I think what we're, in the in, in the short term, we're pushing towards um, no-cost licenses to be able to work with it. Uh, the papers are available online. Um, if that's something you're interested in, please reach out to me because I am desperately trying to get them to let us open source it. So um, we really want it to be something that the community can use. Uh, so any other questions for audience? Again, thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll definitely be in touch. And in yes. case anyone had any other questions, you can reach out to me. I can or directly email her. Yes. So um, thank you again. I All really right, thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good have a good weekend. <laughs> you too.